Well, hey, Brookside, it is so good to be with you today. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jeff, one of the pastors here, and uh, it's just a privilege uh, to be gathered uh, together today. I want to welcome those uh, at our Elkhorn campus. It was so fun being with you guys last weekend. Love seeing what God is doing in Elkhorn. I want to welcome our Correctional Center campus, all of our mods. We just we love doing church with you. And, uh, and then our Miller campus, welcome to you as well as those that are, that are online today. Um, well, today uh, is not only a time where we're going to launch into a new series, which I'm really excited for, um, but today is also Memorial Day. And uh, so what I would love to do here on the front end is uh, just to take a couple of minutes and just pray together as a church, um, uh, not only for the freedoms that you and I get to enjoy, uh, but I'd also love for us to pray. Um, it's been kind of a whirlwind, hasn't it? The last uh, couple days, weeks, you could even go out a little bit further. And uh, there's just a lot going on in our world and in our country. And um, I would love for us as a church just to seek God together on, on some of those things. And so um, would you join me? And then we'll transition. We'll pray um, that God would lead us in this series and this morning as well. Um, but would you pray with me? And, and then uh, we'll dive in after that. So yeah, let's pray together. Well, Lord, first and foremost, um, we want to thank you, Lord, for, for who you are. Um, Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that the gospel is real and it changes lives, and, and Lord, that's why we gather. And so, Father, thank you for who you are. Lord, on a weekend like Memorial Day weekend, we um, also want to just pause and say thank you for the freedoms that in so many ways they shape our lives, um, things that we take for granted often. Even this weekend, we stand back and we just, we remember those, and, and God, um, we not only remember the freedoms, but we remember the lives that were sacrificed for them. And the families that, that stood in the gap when those sacrifices were being made as well. And so, so, Father, it's with gratitude that we pray. Lord, we also look at the challenges that our, our country faces. Uh, we think of Uvalde, Texas, with very heavy hearts. God, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to imagine what, what people are feeling and thinking and, and uh, the doubts they're having and just the, the troubles in their souls this morning even. And um, God, when we don't understand, God, I, I pray that you would give us clarity of thought and clarity of, of, um, of mind. I pray that you would give us grace in these times. We pray your mercy on these families. Um, God, we pray your protection on them. And God, we pray that more than anything else that they would experience your grace. Lord, I think too of just our own teachers, our own administrators right here in our own city. Um, and that carries, all of it carries a special weight for them. And so God, would you... Pour out your grace and your mercy on them as well. Lord, we think even um, just going back another week, God, just of a, a racially charged shooting. And God, we ask that you would bring healing to our nation in these matters. God, we pray you'd forgive us. God, we pray as Brookside Church that we would be, God, that we would be known as a family, a church family, as the people of God. We pray that our city would be known in this way as a group of people that we are known not for what we are against, but God, we are the quickest to step across lines that would separate us. So God, would you give us that grace, we pray. Lord, then we also pray for our leaders. Um, God, we think of those that have influence, and God, we pray that they, their, their hearts would break for the things that break your heart, that the things that are important to you would be so important to them. We think of parts of our world that are impacted by war and brutality and injustice right now. Lord, we think around about the decisions around the sanctity of life. Oh God, would you give us moral strength? Would you give us courage? Psalm 145, verse 18, that the Lord is near to those who call on him. And so God, in, in big faith, we, we call on you. You've given us such a playing field to honor you. And so God, we pray that as a church, as a people, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our nation, God, would we honor you. We pray that, God. Give us help, grace. And then, Lord, for this morning, um, Father, as we jump into a series where we're going to look at the power of God in the lives of five different people, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to see ourselves in these stories. I pray uh, that you would do something inside of each one of us where we go, oh, that's who you are. Oh, that's how you can fit into this part of my life where I haven't invited you yet. And so God, speak to us, Lord. Your, your people are now open-hearted, and we're saying, Lord, speak to us. I pray for the person as well that's here that's saying, I don't know who Jesus is. God, I pray that today you'd make yourself known to them. 
Pray for that person that's listening. I pray for that person that's troubled in one of the mods. Pray for that student at our Elkhorn campus. God, would you do what only you can do in our midst? We love you, and we, we now pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the reason why I'm excited about this series that we're about to jump into today is because it's called Stories of Change. And uh, that's really what Jesus was all about. He was all about changing lives. It was so fun last weekend to be talking to a young man. He's in his 20s and his life has been dramatically changed by Jesus. And it was so fun just to dialogue with him and to hear how he's making decisions for Christ and, and Jesus is just changing and transforming his life. So many of you, if you were to think about your own story, you would say there was a day when your priorities began to shift. You would say that there was a day when Maybe how you looked at your relationships in your life, they began to change, and, and Jesus got a hold of your life. You might even say it like that. Um, you, you gave him control. You said, Jesus, your ways are better than mine, and so you submitted your life to his and to his ways, and you look back on that and you say, God, thank you for that. And so we get excited about a series like this because really at the core of the core of the core, that's really all of that is, is what we're about as a church. We don't we don't gather just to gather. We don't uh, try to serve the city well just because we should. We don't try to raise up the next generation because it's convenient. We do all of these things because we really believe to our core, Jesus Christ changes lives. That that's what it's all about. That that's the gospel. He changes lives. And so we're going to be looking at these five different people. And, and for some of you, you might say, man, I'm more on that, uh, our, our mission as a church is helping people find and follow Jesus. And you might say, I'm more on that trying to find Jesus. I'm exploring who he is. This series, I think, will also be very helpful to you because you're going to get a window into who Jesus is. You're going to get, um, in a sense, we're going to put the spotlight on different characteristics of Jesus. And I think you're going to be able to walk away each week and go, okay, wow, that's helpful to know. Whether you've been walking with God for decades or whether this is all, all very brand new to you. So let me, though, ask you a question uh, to dive into today's topic. Have you ever been around somebody and, and they did something that dramatically changed how you thought of them? Uh, they didn't, maybe it was an interaction that they had with maybe one of their children, or maybe they were leading a group and you watched them do this, or maybe they were caring for someone and, and, and you saw a side of them that you hadn't known before, and from that moment on, it sparked in your mind a different perspective, a different picture of who they are. It changed the way that you think about them. It's likely in this series there'll be a time where you'll say, wow, okay, now I understand Jesus in a, in a new way. Or you'll be able to say, oh, when we, when we looked at that story, I saw myself in that, and so now I understand, I understand how Jesus sees me. In Luke chapter 19, New Testament book of Luke, Jesus gives this summary statement. There are times when, you know, you read through the Bible and you get a summary statement. Hey, church, this is what we're to be about. It's a, it's a very, you know, it just summarizes the mission of what we're to be about. There are other times where Jesus said things that were summary statements about himself. Like, why did he come? What was he about? In Luke 19, we, we get one of those. Jesus says this. He says, I came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, I love that verse for this series because what he was saying is, I came to change people's lives. I, that, that's exactly what I'm about. Why did Jesus leave heaven? Philippians 2, why did he come? Why did he humble himself and, and take on flesh? Why did he do all of these things? Well, it's because he came to seek and to save the lost. It's because he came to help people that were beat up and broken, people that were wandering, people that were spiritually speaking, you could say they were lost. They didn't know where they were going. They hadn't experienced hope. They had no concept of eternal life. And Jesus says, that's who I came for. I came to seek and save the lost. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. That's where our text will be for today. And, and I just want to say to you, I got blindsided by this text this week. In a really good way. It's one of those times where I, I shared with a few people well, what passage I was going to speak on, and they were like, whoa, really? And I was like, yeah, and you, you'll just never believe what God has taught me through this passage. It's just opened my mind to, to just the, the grace and the goodness and the mercy of Jesus in a very fresh way. But I want to actually, before we get to Mark chapter 5, you can stay there, I want to give you some context because Mark chapter 4 is very important to understanding Mark chapter 5. Because in Mark chapter 4, there's a question that gets asked that really sheds light on why Jesus did what he did in Mark chapter 5. 
So picture this, Mark chapter 4, Jesus is with his disciples, they're on the Sea of Galilee, and a storm comes up, and you may be familiar with the story, and it was a storm of all storms, right? I mean, there was lightning, imagine being on a boat in water, lightning's coming down, the wind is just whistling, probably, you know, ripping holes in the sails. I mean, it was an absolute mess, waves are coming over the ship to the point that the disciples said this, they wondered, they said, wow, are are we going to drown? They were wondering this. And then they wake Jesus up, and in a minute, and in a moment, just with the words of his mouth, Jesus says, quiet, be still. And it changed their perspective. It was one of those defining moments because everything went still, and they realized, wow, this isn't just a man. He's not just a good teacher. He actually has command over creation. Now, this last week, I don't know about you, but we had a lot of rain and I, did any of you try this? Did any of you walk outside and before you ran to your car to get you know, in there before you got too soaking wet in the cold, cold rain, did any of you look up into the sky and say, rain, stop, sun, come now. Any of you? Elkhorn, I'm, nobody over there either, okay. That's good, if you did, we actually can give you help. We want to help you, we'll provide whatever it takes. It's not normal, is it? You don't think in our minds. I mean, we read a story like that and we go, oh, that's powerful. But do we really believe that that's powerful? It's not standard operating procedure to to have power over creation. That with the words of his mouth, he was able to calm creation. And his disciples said this in their amazement. And this is what is significant. And this is what ties to chapter 5. They said this. They said, who is he? Who is he that even the wind and the waves, that they obey him? Who is he? Now, what do you think happened next? I don't know about you, but that would be a full day for me. I mean, a good shore lunch with some fresh fish, call it a day. But that's not what happened. Jesus has this question now that's before him. Who who is he? Even the wind and the waves obey him. We want to know more. Who is he? He's amazing us. He's surprising us. We've never seen anything like this. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, hey, I need you to now go. Mark chapter 5, God needs you to row over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He takes them over to the eastern side. Now, everybody, this would have been something that would have triggered these men right away because this was outside of the covenant land of Israel. This was a largely Gentile land. This would have been, in their minds, they would have thought, okay, this is a pagan foreign land. And I'm just speculating here, but I bet you they were wondering, hey, Jesus, do you have your directions wrong? Jesus, it would make sense for us to actually go back this way and not to go that way. We don't belong there. That wouldn't be right for us actually to go over there. And so though when this boat hits the shore, Jesus encounters this man. And everybody, I believe this. I heard another pastor saying that this this week, and I, I, just, I, I totally agree. I think what we're going to see today is the most messed up man in the entire Bible. The most messed up man in the entire Bible. And he comes running to Jesus, and he meets Jesus right there as the boat hits the shore And you might think to yourself, why would Jesus have anything to do with this man? But remember their question, who is he? That even the wind and the waves obey him. And what we find is this. He's the man that would come for a man like this, the man that we're about to see. Look with me at chapter 5, verse 1. It says, they came across the lake to the the region of uh, of the Gerasenes. And it says, and when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, little context. Now, if a Jew had contact with the dead or with graves, it made them unclean. And so everybody, this was a really big deal. This was no small thing what's happening here. Now imagine this man too, he's he's got this impure spirit in him and he lives among the tombs. Imagine this, imagine if you were asked to not live in the neighborhood, you were asked not to live in the downtown high rise, you were actually asked to live outside the city, you were asked to live in the graveyard. It's one thing, isn't it, to live next to a graveyard, it's another thing to live in the graveyard. That's what this man is doing. And so when he sees Jesus, though, he rushes to Jesus, and we know in this moment, Jesus is about to get as unclean as you can get. Look at verse 3. It says the man lived in the tombs, and then it says, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been, so this is on many, get this, this is on many occasions, 
He had been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and he broke the irons on his feet. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. So think about this. He's so insane that he's been pushed out of the city. But now Jesus is approaching him. But look what it says even more about him. It says this. Not only is he insane, but he's, he's likely a, a very much a threat to other people. It says, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, what would he do? He would cry out and he would cut himself with stones. So we've got this man. Night and day he's shrieking. He's in absolute pain. And he's taking these stones and he's cutting his own flesh, his own arms and his whole body. He's writhing in pain. Notice this. He's not even known by his name. He's actually known by where he lives and the insanity of his life. Imagine if he was standing right before you. Physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, this man is hopeless. Imagine living in this city. Imagine, imagine if you called, you know, maybe your men's small group and you said, hey, we got to go get that guy. He's scaring the little children. And so you went and and one of you got some chains, and you had to gang tackle him because he was really strong and violent and destructive. And, and so you finally you got him all chained up, and you thought you had things under control. And you're like, wow. And, and you walked away, and all of a sudden it was just like, boom, Hawk Hogan moment, right? He breaks the chains. I mean, what would you be thinking? I know what I would be thinking. I would be thinking, hide the children. This man, he's hopeless. This man is out of control. You give up on him. Yet, everybody, what was going through the mind of Jesus when Jesus decided, hey, we need to go to the east side of the lake? What was going through the mind of Jesus? They asked this question, who is he? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Everybody, Jesus saw more in this man. Jesus saw, okay, I'm the type that I'm actually going to go to the foreign land. I'm going to actually be the person that I'm not going to run away from a guy like this. I'm actually going to run right to him. I'm going to interact with the one that everybody in the town is calling the freak. I'm not going to be opposed to him. I'm going to go to him. And as I do, you're going to understand some things about me, about the things that drive me, about why I came. This story reminds us of the power of God, but it also reminds us why he came. It gives us such hope. Let me ask you this question. Is there anyone or is there anything in your life that you just wonder, God, could you change this? Is there anything in your life that you would say, I, don't, I wouldn't even want God to come over here. It's too unclean. It's too much shame. There's too much guilt with it. This, this is off limits. I wouldn't even want to invite God into this part of my life. Any relationship in your life, maybe somebody in your family that it just seems too far gone. Oh, if it could change, you would long for it to. Oh, if God's grace could penetrate it, you would welcome it. But you just wonder if he would want to even have anything to do with it. But what if you left here today realizing God would go right to that? God would enter into your place of most pain. Maybe you're in the mods today and you're just thinking, wow, I've missed it. My life is just passed me by. I'm stuck here and when I get out, things are not ever going to return to be the same and there's no hope for me. I want you to know this. Jesus enters right into times like that to, to every single one of us. Look at verse 6. It says that when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran, this man, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus? Notice he knows the name of Jesus. Son of the most high God. In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. So we learn this man is possessed by a demon. So Jesus is addressing the demon. Verse 9 then Jesus asked him, what is your name? So talking to the demon, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. So Legion means this, it could mean up to 10, imagine this, not just one, that would be bad enough. It could be up to 10,000 demons in this man. And it says, and he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Verse 11, a large herd of pigs was feeding 
on a nearby hillside, and the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to go into them. Verse 13, he gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the deep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and they reported this in the town and the countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. Verse 15, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there. Remember, he's the talk of the town. He had to be. Dressed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. It's interesting. They were afraid of Jesus. His power, who is he? He even commands the wind and the waves and then he casts these demons out of this man And now this man appears to be in his right mind, and he's okay. Verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. I want to be around you more. You healed me. Verse 19, Jesus did not let him, but he said, go, go to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and he began to tell in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. We'll come back to that. Now, if you read this story in isolation, without that question in your mind, who is he? You might be tempted to think, at least on first read, I know I was, Wow, this is a uh, this is a cool story. It, 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 you know, this guy got delivered, and and it's very powerful. And I hope Jesus reimbursed them for the pigs. And you know, that might be kind of where your mind goes. But when you ask the question, "Who is he?" and you realize the point that Jesus is making, it sheds a lot of light on not only what's happening in this particular passage, but also on the character of God. Questions like this get answered. What does this teach us about him? What does this teach us about our world? What does this teach us about the power of God? What does this, this, this story teach us about how you and I interact with God? What does it teach us about how when we know who God is, how do we respond to him? So three things I want us to pull out of this. The first one is this. Through this story, everybody, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God loves the unlovable. This man, very likely the most messed up man in the entire Bible. God loves the unlovable. God saves the unsavable. God comes for the broken. God enters into the midst of real pain and real issues. God is one who brings wholeness to things that are not right. God is the one that brings grace into situations where you just don't know what to do. God is the one who brings an answer sometimes when you don't have a clue what you should do or how you should go. God is the one who sometimes can do this, and some of you have experienced this. You've experienced a sense of peace and grace in the midst of a storm like you've never experienced before. It's who he is. He calls this man to his family. It's not like God says, hey, I'm just going to heal you up, but you are a little awkward and weird. you got a weird past. I don't want you too close to me. No, no, no. Jesus calls him right smack dab into his own family. Don't miss everybody the picture of Jesus here. You've got a tormented man that Jesus does not avoid, but he goes right to him. This picture of Jesus, everybody, don't let it kind of just fly over you today. This is such a sweet picture of God. When you see someone that you feel like, oh, they're just a little strange, everybody think of this story and realize, oh, I'm a little strange. And God, you came for me. And God, your compassion is good. Not only do we see the power of God in this story, oh, we see the heart of God, the love of Jesus Christ. Have you ever felt like you're too far gone for God? Have you ever felt like that? Everybody, from a story like this, 
realize that whether it's your pain, your past, divorce, whatever it is, whether you feel like it's your, an addiction, what, whatever issue it is that you feel like separates you from God, realize this. Jesus Christ came to jump right into that. I came, he said, to seek and to save what was lost. That's why I came. I think this passage also does this. Convicted me. Oh, I need to be praying for things that I've written off. I need to have greater faith because Jesus has such power. So I don't need to give up on that. It's actually wise for me to invite God into the things that maybe I feel like are too far off. For some of you, you have a dream that God has put into your heart, into your mind, that he would be so honored if you would give your life to it. But you're afraid. And know this, Jesus, latch on to his power. Latch on to his power. The second thing I think this story reminds us of is this. It's that there is a, a battle that's raging in our world. It's not nice. It's not clean. It's, it's dangerous. There is a battle. There is real spiritual warfare happening. Ephesians chapter 6 in the New Testament talks about this. And everybody, it would be naive for you and I to walk through life and to not be, uh, for this not to be on our minds not to dominate us and to, for us to walk around in, in, in timidity and, and to walk around in, in a whole lot of fear. But it would be wise for us to realize that it's happening. That there's a war that's raging for your very soul. And it leads us to this question. How do I look at the power of God in the midst of a spiritual battle that's raging? How do I see Jesus in the midst of the realities in which you and I live? Everybody, this is great news. Because God opposes the demonic world does not mean that God and the demonic world are on the same level. Some of you, 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 um, you like to watch uh, MMA fighting or you, you like boxing matches. And, and when you hear about a fight that's coming out and you know, oh, these two are evenly matched, you get really excited because you know, oh, it's oh, it's going to be a dogfight. I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be such a battle, and you're not sure who's going to win. And, and, uh, and so you, 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 you want to be attuned to that battle. Everybody know this. The battle between Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, it will not be challenged by the demonic forces of this world. It will not be challenged by him. It is not the case with Jesus and the enemy. They are opposites, but they are not equals. The authority of God is unmatched. His title, his name, his renown, his reputation, his greatness, it is not challenged. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 says this. It says, with the breath of his mouth, Satan will be destroyed. This story displays the power of God, but it also shows us in a very real sense the realities of this world and so it should call us as people to say, I want to cling to Jesus. I want to cling to the one who is victorious. The third thing is this. The third thing is this. This story teaches us that the mercy of God is for us. That Jesus has power and authority over demons and animals and nature and people. And that the mercy of our Savior, it sets people free. Again, you might have been tempted when you heard this story just to think, wow, that's just a nice story, but honestly, it doesn't apply to me. I mean, I might have a messed up past, but I never, I didn't grow up in a graveyard, right? I mean, that dude's messed up. And so I can, I hear you, but I don't relate. And so maybe this story doesn't really, maybe doesn't grip your heart. This gripped my heart this week. According to the words of the Apostle Paul, this man's story in Mark chapter 5, church, it's actually very similar to my story. And it's very similar to your story. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writes this. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins. Sounds a little like a graveyard experience. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and not the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. So what it's saying is this, that before Jesus, you were heavily influenced by Satan. You were heavily influenced by the kingdom of the air, the one who was at work in you when you were not with Christ. And then verse 3 says this, all of us. So it's not just some, it's not just one or two of you. 
It says, all of us also lived among them, literally meaning this, to be bound continually. We lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. When the townspeople saw this man, it's very unlikely that any of them were thinking, oh, let's give him grace. Oh, he deserves grace. That's not what they were thinking. Romans chapter 8, though, says this, what can separate us from the love of God? Look at this next verse in Ephesians 2, verse 4. It says, but because of his great love for us. So even though I deserve the wrath of God, even though that's exactly what I deserve, but because of his great love for us, us, God, who is, here it is, again, you're hearing it again, Mark 5, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Everybody, when you think of this man Think of yourself. When you think of this man, when you think of his brokenness, think of yourself. Think of yourself right in the middle of maybe your destructive patterns, right in the middle of your self-righteousness, right in the middle of my pride and my arrogance, right in the middle of whatever sin continues to plague your heart. But then do hear this, God who is rich in mercy. Before you ever got cleaned up, God who is rich in mercy saved us. He makes what is unclean absolutely clean. He takes what is lost what is shunned, and he redeems it. The Old Testament book of Leviticus, we see this. There was this practice that that if you were unclean, you let other people know that because there were all these ceremonies that if you became unclean, like these people would have been viewed when they crossed that lake. So these people in, in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, if you were unclean, you let other people know that so they didn't come near you. And so Leviticus chapter 13, it says that they covered the lower part of their face and they would cry out to protect others. They would say, unclean, unclean. But everybody know this, when God sees you, he doesn't say unclean, unclean. When God sees you, he looks at you if you're in Christ, if you put your faith in him. And he says, that's my child. You're clean. You're forgiven. You've been given grace. You're redeemed. The power of God for this man is the same power that is for you and I. Everybody, who wants the worst? Who wants the doubting? Who wants the confused? Who wants the arrogant? Who wants the thief, the criminal? Who wants the proud? Who wants the apathetic in their faith? Everybody, here's who. Jesus Christ. Oh, I love this spotlight that we give. I I wonder if when we get to heaven, if we'll, you know, get to see this man and and it'll be great to learn what his name is, won't it? I just wonder if we'll get to see him. And if we do, I think what we'll do is we'll thank him. Because I don't know that we'll ever see people the same again. Because now when I think about this guy, I think, I'm like that. I was dead, but now I'm alive. I really lived among the tombs. But he saved me. I want to reread the very last verse and leave you with this. Verse 20 says, So the man went away and he began to tell in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And then it says, And all the people were amazed. Did you ever think that the guy with demons would be the one that Jesus says, Hey, I want you to go and be my ambassador? Isn't that cool? Everybody, Jesus changed his lives. Notice, though, notice the response. It says that they were amazed. It says that they were amazed. I mean, they didn't know what to say. It was one of those moments in that boat. Who is he? The people just stood back and they were amazed. And so I would love for us to pray together today and just say, Lord, would you, would you amaze me? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, if we're in Christ, I pray that today we would be amazed at the fact that in you we are made alive. God, we're not, we don't need to stay dead in our transgressions and our sins. No, Lord, you rescued us. You redeemed us. You pulled us out of that. So, God, we stand, oh, knowing you, we stand amazed. And, and, and even beyond that, Lord, we, we think of your power and we say, Lord, would you amaze me in the area that I've written off? God, would you amaze me in the relationship that seems too far gone? God, would you amaze me in what so often seems like such a godless world? Oh, God, would you... Would you amaze us by your power? 
God, would you show us who you are? Would you amaze us? And then, Lord, oh, I think of the person, and maybe this is you. You have never put your faith in Jesus. Maybe today's the day for the very first time you step into relationship with him, and you just say, Jesus, I'm amazed that you came, that you dwelt among us, that you lived, that you died, and you died for me. So, Lord, I don't need to stay dead. My soul does not need to live among the tombs. But, God, you can set me free in relationship with you. And so I stand amazed. And so, Lord, now we pray as we worship you. We just pray, Lord, that you would be exalted. God, that you'd be raised up in this place. Because, God, you've had victory. You have victory over the enemy. You defeat him. And, Father, we thank you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name.